81% of Montanans participate in outdoor recreation. Over 90% of Montanans identify that outdoor recreation is a, a very essential part of who they are and their way of life. And we're talking about our way of life, right? Outdoor recreation contributes to our way of life, our quality of life, what we do, what brings us happiness and joy and health. But it also is an economic powerhouse. And this is what we have gotten so great with our industry partners and now with the Bureau of Economic Analysis in the federal government at articulating is this economic connection between outdoor recreation and us living our best lives to the economic benefits of it. So in Montana, the last consumer spending numbers we have from the Outdoor Industry Association, $71 billion of consumer spending in the state of Montana on outdoor recreation. And the really cool fact in that is that almost half of those dollars, about half of those dollars are spent by Montanans in Montana, just enjoying our way of life. So a lot of those dollars are new dollars, people coming in to experience that way of life as it has to do with recreation. But a lot of that is just us and our way of life. And so that equates to, if we have 71,000 jobs, that's about 10% of Montana's jobs are related to outdoor recreation in some way. Um, you know, obviously it's going to be an economic driver as far as, you know, taxation that's collected on wages um, that we're paying out to people. Um, but if we look at that on the national scale, I've got a little bar chart right there. And what that bar chart shows is we're at about $900 billion in consumer spending nationally. And to put that into perspective, that's twice the size of the U.S. automotive industry and twice the size of the U.S. pharmaceutical industry. Now, those are known as economic powerhouses, and we hear about that a lot. Well, now we know where to place outdoor recreation in that. And those were, um, those are consumer spending numbers, but then in 2018, we had Bureau of Economic Analysis numbers come out identifying that 2.2% of the US GDP is linked to outdoor recreation, which is a huge number. And then just this last year, we were able to get state by state data. And this is where we in Montana really need to pay attention. Montana, our GDP, our gross domestic product, 5.1% of our GDP is directly linked to outdoor recreation. That's second in the nation, only behind Hawaii. And in this analysis of economic data, you do see this amazing symbiotic relationship between states that have high experiential GDP relationship and high manufacturing GDP relationship. And so you see this like nationwide symbiotic um, benefits to this. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, outdoor recreation, Office of Outdoor Recreation and growing and enhancing the outdoor recreation community or um, economy, we have to look at what role that really plays in communities. And that leads us into what we're talking about today. Outdoor recreation, it's not just about fun and us having fun. It's about providing economic diversification in some communities. It's about providing, um, you know, a not just healthy individuals, but healthy communities as far as health, physical health and well-being. So then you have economic diversification, which provides for health and, or for, for the well-being. Outdoor recreation amenities and our available access to those and those opportunities, that's what's actually pulling in jobs, pulling in employees, pulling in new businesses in a lot of um, the state. So if we look at outdoor recreation, this is really what is is fostering a lot of, say, tech industry growth or others. So this is a really essential way that Montana is really moving forward and how we're benefiting from that. Um, you know, through my work in the last few years, we've done a lot of stuff we'll talk about later on too, but you know, even a recent poll came out um, and it, it showed that the Office of Outdoor Recreation and the work that we're doing to enhance this economy, it's supported across the board. 83% Republican, 98% Democrat, 82% independents really believe in this. And we understand that this is, this is where all of our common visions and goals um, come together and that we can really work towards together. Well, that's, it's, it's powerful stuff. And I think, um, you know, part of the reason and that we've been talking and we will talk in more detail is that, you know, these great outdoor recreation places don't happen by accident. And I think that, you know, Rachel, part of what we're seeing is what we've taken for granted as Montanans is number one, economically powerful, and number two, you know, can get overcrowded 
<laughs> so, um, so maybe we can talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how to deploy resources to make um, more spaces available for, for folks to enjoy. Um, I, I will, will, um, will dive into the Great American Outdoors Act. Um, so this huge piece of legislation, which is um, once in a lifetime, has passed and has been signed by the president. Um, it's a big piece of business with some big numbers, um, and we're going to have to really think hard and work hard to figure out how to get those funds to the ground to support our outdoor recreation economy and quality of life. Um, you know, one thing that's a huge game changer about it is that we've had some of these funds in the past, but we haven't been able to rely on them. So um, let's talk a little bit more about um, what this will do for, for front country. And I will say, I have a little bit of a relationship with the Land and Water Conservation Fund because we're both the same age. We were born <laughs> the same year. And so when those numbers spill off my tongue about how old LWCF is, um, I want you to know I have a personal relationship. We are tight. Okay, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the Great American Outdoors, what's in it? Yeah, so this is this is what I love about this. Um, during the, the, the lobbying for and the um, pushing for support of the Great American Outdoors Act and then supporting of LWCF, Land and Water Conservation Fund, um, you, we all knew that it was good and we all wanted it to pass and a lot of people didn't even know what LWCF stood for and they were just like, yes, we want it. And so you saw this huge support for LWCF, which was coming out, which was great. But really in the Great American Outdoors Act, there was two big hunks of really important information. And I'm gonna to touch on the one that we're not gonna talk about a ton right now, but we're gonna talk about the maintenance backlog. A lot of people that pay attention to, you know, our national parks and um, going out and doing things, they would hear the conversation about maintenance backlog. Now, what is very significant on the 60,000 foot level that I love, love, love to hear is that we're talking about national parks, we're talking about national forests, we're talking about BLM lands, all of our, our national, you know, jointly owned public lands as being infrastructure that supports this behemoth economy. Yes, it's the right thing to do for our health and well-being, to for intact environments, for our health, for all of those things, but this is a huge portion of the infrastructure that supports this, this economy. And we're talking about caring for that, right? We're talking about caring for that. And we're talking about it in the terms of maintenance. And the way that this is significant is that we're talking about the infrastructure that supports our, our outdoor recreation way of life and economy, the same way that we're talking, um, or the same way that other segments of the economy are talking about this. We talk about infrastructure, we talk about maintenance. And this is really important. We have to identify that we need to invest in that infrastructure to make sure it's maintained and it continues to support us, right? So part of Great American Outdoors Act was that maintenance backlog. And it's 1.9 billion over the course of five years that goes to national parks, Forest Service, BLM, and other entities um, to really address a lot of what has been pushed aside and not taken care of. So this is super exciting. And we're all going to see the benefits of this funding in all of our surrounding national parks and forests. So we could all look forward to seeing so much more work on the ground, um, really, you know, maintaining everything that we love to go and use. Now, the next part of that that we're going to talk about, we're going to dive into a little bit more thoroughly, is the permanent full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So LWCF, it has been around for a while. We know this. Um, and what it is, is it's, um, it's basically money from offshore drilling that's put into a fund to then create these opportunities, recreation, conservation style um, opportunities. And I use recreation and conservation very closely together because conservation goes hand in hand with um, recreation. And so what has happened is they created this fund and it's up to 900 you know, million dollars a year. This it sounds all great and everything, but when it was created, 
it wasn't it had to be reauthorized so every couple of years it would have to be reauthorized everybody would have to get together and agree like yeah we're gonna do this and as a result there would be a lot of lag time opt-in times and bumps in the road so there was constant fight to get it reauthorized yes it's important and it contributes to what we do and then it wasn't mandatory that they fully funded it so it could say hey we can spend up to 900 million dollars but in the 54 years, it's only been fully funded twice. There were some years where like almost no money went into this. And so as you know, it's this, it, it has done great good, but always everybody's seen the potential, like how, how could, could we have it if we had guaranteed money to work with and, and we could count on this and we could really plan and we could, we could really, you know, form a plan around this. So that's why this is so significant is people have been fighting this for this for a very long time. There's people probably that are listening right now this has been a conversation and a fight and things that people have been working on for years and years and years. This is not something that happened overnight. So many people have been working on this to get this through. And I really want to acknowledge the hard work that everybody has done to do this. So there's, there's, a, there's a statistic thrown around there, and I think it's probably pretty true, but really close. There's almost no county in the United States that has not seen investment from LWCF in some way. And I do believe that that's true for Montana. I believe every county in the state of Montana has seen, you know, benefit from LWCF. So now that we know it's permanently authorized and it's going to be fully funded, that means we've got money coming at us. And there are, you know, it's a lot of money. Um, so here you've got, you broke down the allocation, and even if you want to go over allocation, there's a federal side of this, and there's a state side of this. Well, let's, yeah, so I, I probably should have put this slide forward, but that, um, that national, the National Parks Fund, um, you can see there's a $12 billion backlog with the National Park Service. Forest Service has a $5.2 billion backlog. Fish and Wildlife Service, 1.3 billion. I mean, these are big, big numbers. So they've got that um, national parks and federal land over and above LWCF will be uh, able to address some of those infrastructure needs. Can you tell, talk about, I mean, we hear LWCF, LWCF, um, but it's really a little bit more complicated than just LWCF. Could you go through the um, type, the the funding pots within LWCF for us? Sure. And actually, you kind of break it down right here, which is really great. And everybody can just refer back to that. Um, and this is obviously, it has fluctuated over the years as far as like how much money goes where and, and depending on how much was funded and what's going there, this, that, and the other. But just in general terms, that LWCF, a portion of the pie goes to the federal, um, federal land managers and stewards to accomplish this goal of, you know, providing, you know, recreation assets, access to, et cetera, for federal partners. So people that are managing our parks, the Forest Service, all those guys. And then there's a portion of the pie that comes over to the states. So the states can do the same thing. And then there is that other pie that money goes into to accomplish same kind of goals in a different way. And I think is it the next slide you have, super yeah. awesome pie and this was this is basically over time right all of the um allocation of lwcf money has broken out to be about this much and what we're going to touch on today is that black piece of the pie it's those state grants and this is the money that you know we as communities uh within the state have access to um rachel we'll move on but i do want to point out one thing because i think I, i've heard people are confused about this I've said it, I'll say it again. You know, the national parks and public land funding is over and above LWCF. So if you can see on the pie with the bulk is 60% is, uh, federal land acquisition, which is the park service, forest service, fish and wildlife service, that funding will still be available, but the infrastructure and maintenance piece will be additional money for those backlogs. So uh, sometimes I hear people, you know, combine those. And that's part of the reason I use the word unpack is because we got to unpack it because there's a lot, there's a lot there and understanding what's available and how is where we're going. 
That's a so, really good point. So exactly. So when we talk about that piece, it's the maintenance backlog. It is specifically just for that maintaining what already exists. And then you have LWCF funding that can help create new. So um, LWCF stateside has been sort of a quiet program. A lot of, we don't hear a lot about it. Um, it's it's uh, usually associated with, with ball fields and swimming pools, but because there's more available and because we're really looking at building, building out um, and supporting Montana's economy, would you take some time to just really kind of drill down onto the stateside piece? Who, who can apply for it? What can, yeah. what can it be used for? Why is it hard? <laughs> Why is it hard to use? And unfortunately that part hasn't changed, but at least there's more money that's hard to use, right? So that's why we're here. Right, right. This is a good problem to have. This is yeah. awesome. And I know like in further, you know, in more of these webinars, I know that you'll be able to dive into a lot of the little detailed nuts and bolts of this, but just from a big picture perspective. So what LWCF has done for states, um, so you know, in order for a state to be eligible to receive their portion of the funds, we have to produce every five years what's called the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. It's called SCORP for short. And so if a state shows that they have actually put their brain power to what they want recreation to mean and be in their states, then they're eligible for these funds. And what that SCORP does is it outlines the priorities for a state. What do you care about as a state? And to address that, we just went through a cycle of creating our new 2019 SCORP. Um, my office was a part of the, the, um, the push to create the kind of new format that we have. We have a, a thousands of stakeholders. We had um, listening sessions across the state. We had, you know, um, an advisory council and panel. Um, a lot of feedback went into the current SCORP as we have it, because what we wanted to do is really provide um, we wanted to provide vision. We wanted to provide, um, you know, inspiration. We wanted to provide, um, you know, more of a usable document to help folks look at, okay, as a state, this is what we see our outdoor recreation goals as, as being. And then how does that relate to communities? Does your community identify with those? And then how can we move forward with those? And SCORP is used in, in the, um, the review of grants, um, a couple different grant programs out of the state. Um, so, you know, it's important for people to know that that tool is there. So as we've had it, we've had a little over a million dollars on the best years um, coming in. And that money comes into the state. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks um, actually um, facilitates the collection of and the distribution of those funds. And now that we've got full funding, we as a state look to double the amount of funds that will be available. So almost $3 million per year is going to be able to come into the state. And historically, we have relied heavily on that money. That money is available for us as a state to work on all of our state parks, which is awesome. Um, another source of funding for state parks. Um, and then that is also available for state, local, or tribal, tribal public, um, bo public bodies to use for recreation type assets um, in, their in and around their communities. So it's not something that's private. Um, the reason for that is because this is significant amounts of money, right? And this can be used to really be a game changer in and around communities. But you also want to look at the longevity of this, because if we're going to create these assets, they have to be taken care of and they need to go on in perpetuity. So they want to make sure the LWCF funding, um, they want to make sure that the, the, the entities that are using these funds and creating these assets will be around to continue on the maintenance and the existence of those, okay? So that's who's eligible. And the way that the, these funds work, it's amazing because it's a lot of money. We can get a lot of money to do these things. Um, but because it's a lot of money, it can be tough and challenging for lots of communities to access the funds. And, and this is the reason why. These funds is a 50-50 match, right? So basically you're saying, I have a million dollar project. I'm going to come up with 50% of the dollars and LWCF is going to come up with 50% of those dollars. 
So it's just a match. So you have to have half the money. So if you want $100,000, you gotta show you have $100,000. Additionally, this program, it's a reimbursable program. So you as a community do have to come up with the full amount of money to get your project done. And then once it is on the ground, open to the public, you submit those receipts and you will get your money. So you do have to cover everything because it's a reimbursement. Um, and again, also, like I said, the reason, you know, these outdoor recreation um, amenities that you need to show that they will be available in perpetuity. This is something that you plan for the long term, um, you know, vitality of your communities and around them. And so that's why you have to have those partners. Uh, you can find out more information about LWCF and you can see a full list of all the projects that have been funded and current information on um, the Montana State Parks um, page and find out more information there. Also the National Park Service, they hold all that information and you can get some great overviews there. So that's kind of the rough, you know, information about how you go about getting it. So uh, you talked about, um, you know, partnerships, um, even though a private um, entity or nonprofit can't apply or hold it, they do have a really vital role to play um, in making a project successful. Because, because the reality is, is, is we know now in these days, you know, it's really about partnerships and strong partnerships. So you talked about SCORP a little bit. Maybe could you explain what some of the SCORP priorities are, particularly for front country recreation, and um, maybe help people start thinking about like what, what does a good project, uh, what does it look like? And Rachel, we will post, thank you. We will, uh, we will post a link to, um, to the resources um, as uh, on the, um, Montana Access Project website. We'll put links to those to those um, other sources. But I'm just going to tell you, as a person who does recreation, creates recreation, thinks about recreation in the Whitefish Trail, Montana State Parks, it's kind of a little bit hard to figure out where all this information is. Number one, and number two. It's either, it's sometimes so general as to be like, oh, what do, what do we do with this? So um, just no, we're gonna, you know, you communities out there that are maybe in the same boat that I am, um, uh, we're just gonna help connect the dots um, about when the funding's available, how to access the funding, um, drill down on some of these pieces that Rachel's gonna go through and just know, um, that helping make available resources more accessible for for communities is where we're going with this so yeah Please. so like i i held up so this was our this is our score current score that we go through and just to give you an idea of what we um the the large team of folks that got together all of the citizens that came and submitted comment in person or online we defined six goals right now in Montana, and you'll find goals and you'll find more information underneath each of these goals. But some of them are like honoring Montana's outdoor legacy, you know, and how hunting and angling fits into that and how we are looking at that or whether it's cultural um, legacy that we want to look at. Um, adapt outdoor recreation for a changing environment. Things are changing and how do we make sure if this is economic vitality in our state, on many levels, like we talked about, if that's changing, how are we looking at adapting to that? Um, it's improving quality of life through outdoor recreation experiences, supporting economic vitality of communities in the state, enhancing public access of outdoor recreation resources and facilities, and promoting outdoor recreation opportunities for all Montanas, Montanans. So those were those big overarching goals. And then there's recommendations underneath each of those as to how we're gonna go about doing that. Um, and so SCORP right now as it sits is actually a great big picture template with a lot of articulation and inspiration that communities can look to. And really, um, and this is why this is so important, we have a lot of pieces in the works obviously on this and we can talk a little bit about them later, but private individual, you know, entities that have 
amazing projects that relate to recreation for the benefit of communities, um, that's why these partnerships are so important. So municipalities having relationships with user groups, clubs, et cetera, all working together. And it's really about this joint vision because there are so many really sources for funding and help to, um, to accomplish our goals. A lot of times this group doesn't know what this group is doing and maybe they're going after the same funds, but they have similar goals that are gonna to reach together, right? And then you have municipalities that have goals of trying to accomplish this and that. So they don't necessarily, let's say water treatment is, is more important right now than a trail system for them. But if these, everybody can come together and work together and identify these different sources of a large picture um, as to a recreation identity, then having everybody on board, having a conversation, having a broader vision with a little more thought towards the future, that's the kind of thinking and that's the kind of um, collaboratives that are forming that really are getting things done. Um, Whitefish Legacy Partners, the Whitefish Trails, perfect example of that. Um, but you know, and, and that's economic vitality. I found, actually where was it? Headwaters Economics, love all of their stuff. Um, but I was reading through some, uh, um, some information that Ray had given to um, the Natural Resource Committee uh, as testimony you know, to outdoor recreation and, and why LWCF is important. So an example of effective investment in recreation um, is the Methow Valley, North Central Washington, famous for extensive um, system of summer trails and groomed winter ski tracks. Um, in an economic impact study, they found for every $1 spent on trail infrastructure, there's been a $6 return to their local businesses. Um, and so these are just some of the benefits, right, to recreation. And so that's why kind of every level in community involvement really should look at this. So we can look at it um, at SCORP, we can identify how our priorities in our local communities see that and get everybody and put a plan in place. Like how can we pool together and bite off hunks of this as we go and find the funding, right, for one piece at a time. Um, and it really is making a plan and getting that funding picture in, um, in place. But of course you have partnerships, right? So um, again, sorry, going around here different. So you, you're gonna address <laughs> SCORP, how it's planned, get your partnerships and talk about that vision, right? And, and then put this big picture plan, develop the project, and then find funding. You can put that into, into um, action, receive your LWCF grant, and then be in re reimbursed for that, right? That's the optimum like kind of strategy you're gonna go and attack. So Rachel, one thing um, that I find is, um, particularly in communities that maybe don't have a lot of local government planning capacity, say, maybe a community that doesn't even have a recreation department or planning and recreation or a county. Um, how, how do you, how are you seeing people that to plug into a larger picture if they just have a project that they want to bring forward, but without that infrastructure, the capacity, the community capacity? Yeah, it's, um, it's really hard. So um, this is where reaching out and getting those partnerships together is really, really key. Um, so something that we've seen and something that, ha that has happened, does happen all the time, is you see grant opportunities. You see grant opportunities for um, you know, outdoor recreation planning for communities. Um, you and I have talked very frequently, there's always a plan put together, but there's not that real help for the implementation process of it. So communities can put to get together, apply for grants to get visions in place to help them go through a planning process to do these things. Um, but as far as it's, it's hard, it's super daunting to do this. Um, and so that's why kind of we can talk a little bit more later on. For me, out of my office, if I'm talking about economic vitality as linked to recreation, as economic diversification, just a piece of the puzzle, it's very important for me to be able to look every community in this state in the eye and say, yes, regardless of your size, regardless of your resources, regardless um, you know, of all of those things, um, there are resources to help you do this. It doesn't require you getting a grant. It doesn't require you know, having this monumental extensive um, 
background and services. And so that's why my office is currently working um, with the University of Montana and some federal partners to put together um, an actual pathway for communities to go through this process, to form plans, to figure out these implementation strategies. So once you have that in play, it is going to be much easier for, easier for you to obtain these funds, but also the expertise that is surrounding every single one of these communities. Um, it, the, there's, not, there's not a magical solution, um, but we are surrounded by the people who know how to make this happen. It's pulling all of those pieces together. Well, that's exciting. And I think, um, you know, we've all, every community has faced that chicken and egg piece. So um, the fact that there's actually, if we work together smarter, um, that we can, can access those funds, that would be great. And, and of course, it's not just for tourism. Like every, sometimes you think re recreation and tourism, but it's really um, factors heavily into to health and quality of life too. I think recreation access, access to nature close in is a huge component of quality of life. Um, I wanna make sure that we have enough time for you to talk about the zillion uh, projects that you're working on. Um, so let's wrap up this part a little bit and um, move on to have you, Rachel, um, let us know in more detail how we can stay engaged with your office. Um, one, one thing that we're looking at is um, the, it, it, it depends how the money comes down and when it comes down, but most in the past, the funding cycle for LWCF stateside uh, starts in November with awards in February of of 2021 and i think um i think the the low the state administering office for that is um, montana state parks um, they recommend uh funding grants to the national park service oversight uh who uh, um accepts their recommendations generally and um you know it'll be interesting because i think for community driven projects um there hasn't been a lot of call on this funding source because it's it's hard to match and it's hard to um to 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 front um so you know we'll also be looking at ways as 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 they are as you know outdoor recreation is looking across the country of, of, yeah, okay, so we have the money, but how do we really make it more accessible and get it on the ground in the places that really need it? It's a huge challenge. It's always been a challenge. It'll continue to be a challenge, um, but one that is worth, um, you know, rising up for. So will you talk a little bit, Rachel, about um, what your office has going on um, and how to stay engaged? Absolutely. So again, if you know, go to the FWP um, website to get more information about you know, cycles for the grant process. Um, and, and, and that will give everybody you know, ideas of, of what timing looks like and, and what kind of, um, you know, like the time frame you have to put things together. But, Talking about, so what I've been working on, on from my office is also being able to communicate to communities very broadly so everyone understands the benefits of this. This should not be an onerous task to pull together collaboratives and communities when you can look each other in the eye and understand how beneficial this is to every aspect of the community. Um, so right now what I'm working on, I've got, I've had this um, very well dog-eared um, outdoor recreation in Montana's economy. Um, at the end of this month, I am working on the final draft of a new updated version of this. And what this does is it gives you a lot of great facts and figures and data to help everyone understand the economic impl impl implications of recreation in and around our communities. 
So that is going to be a resource that I, I print copies of, but is also available digitally on my website. I will also pass it, of course, over to you, Diane. You can have it on your website. Everybody spread the word. It's a lot of great, useful information in there. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I always encourage folks to that are looking for information, inspiration. Um, Headwaters Economics has fantastic information as it relates to public land, recreation opportunity, economic vitality. Um, you can go to their website and they're based out of Bozeman. Same with Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research. Um, we're actually very cutting edge in Montana and we've had that institute for quite some time, you know, looking at a lot of the tourism impacts, but now more so recreation impacts on tourism and resident way of life and, and how that relates to what we're all trying to accomplish as Montanans. Um, I talked a little bit about um, the, the new partnership um, that we're working on. Um, Diane, you're coming in and working on this with us, but um, this is um, a great, uh, we're going to manufacture an amazing pathway, DIY pathway for communities to really take a hold of their recreation identity and move forward and act upon this. There are tools out there, there's expertise on there, out there, but just like you said, Diane, where does it sit? How do I get a hold of it? And how do I make sense of it? Like what the heck applies to me and what doesn't it? And that is what this pathway is going to do. It is going to start creating a much clearer path for a vision of a community and how they relate to their surrounding um, land stewards and managers. Um, so we should have more information coming out on that, especially at the Outdoor Recreation Summit. So the Business of Outdoor Recreation Summit 2020 has gone virtual, and that's where we're gonna have really in-depth information about this project we're working on with the University of Montana. Um, it is going to be virtual. It's October 13th through the 15th. Um, you can go to my webpage, the Montana Governor's Office of Outdoor Recreation. Um, there's a link to that opportunity and um, you can start registering for that. It's all going to be virtual online and if you can't attend live, we'll have it recorded so everybody can come and review and see um, what's moving and shaking in the world. Uh, we started that summit in 2018. It was so amazing and I hope lots of you that are on here, you know, were able to attend us and attend with us um, in 18 and then come to the Recreation Innovation Lab, which we had following up in 2019. Um, the in-person thing, a little challenging right now, so we're taking it vis um, virtual. So that's going to be great. Um, so that, those are the kind of the immediate things we've got kind of going on out of the office right now. Um, well, you, so have, you, you have about one. We got to wrap up here. Um, I, I got to see if there's some questions. Um, if you want to, uh, you can sign up uh, for the summit with Rachel. You can sign up on the uh, Montana Access Project website, both to get a copy of this recording, share it with folks. We will, pound, we will gather these resources that uh, Rachel has offered. We're, we'll send out, you know, sign up and you'll get funding alerts for some of these major um, funding sources for front country recreation, developed recreation, parks, trails, uh, water access, et cetera. And sign up for our next series. Uh, the series, that our next webinar will be making the match. So we'll talk about on the ground, real world examples of how uh, communities, nonprofits, land managers, um, users of lovers of the outdoors have come up with super innovative ways to make those hard matches. Um, uh, yes. Scorp, getting a copy of SCORP, best way. Yeah, it's super easy. easy. You just Google search Montana, you know, statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. It should come up, but it's also held on Fish, Wildlife, and Parks on the Parks website. So if you go there, you can find the latest copy of our score. Uh, we'll put uh, as our resource page for this webinar and these issues, we'll, we'll include a link to at the uh, mcaccessproject.com. Well, we're out of time. Um, we could talk about this forever, which Rachel and I do. So uh, sign up, stay tuned, um, path ahead, and um, we'll look forward to hearing from you next time. Thank you all. Thanks for joining.